Jennifer and June Gibbons were born on April 11th, 1963. And although their parents were originally from Barbados, the family relocated to raise the girls in Wales. Growing up, the girls were quite shy and their parents had a lot of trouble getting them to come out of their shells and talk to other people. They just really didn't want to interact with anyone else and preferred hanging out with each other. But like, who wouldn't when you've got a built-in buddy everywhere you go? No need to make friends when you're a package set. When the girls were toddlers, their mom noticed that they had a lot of difficulty talking and she worried that they might grow up with speech impediments. The twins would talk to each other, but not in the way normal kids talked. The girls spoke really really quickly and in a version of Creole that made it totally impossible for anyone to understand them. And the kicker? The twins also moved in perfect synchronism. Okay, I gotta say, I was with them up until this part. Identical twin? Sure. Wouldn't talk to anyone? Yeah, I get it. But moving at the same time? That's a hard pass for me, dog. So how exactly would they do this? Apparently, when one twin would start a movement, the other would just follow perfectly and complete the movement with them. So like if Jennifer started walking in front of June, June would walk in perfect synchronicity with Jennifer, oftentimes without even having to watch her. And get this, anytime the twins did this in public and got double takes or strange looks, they would just immediately stop and freeze in place and just stare at the person until they'd leave. The Gibbons family were some of the only people of color in their entire neighborhood, and the twins were the only black children at their entire school. So the racism and bullying towards them was rampant. It doesn't take a historian to know that being the only black children in the neighborhood in the 60s was not going to be an easy experience. The girls were totally traumatized by their peers, and this only caused them to cling to each other more. And soon their language became more idiosyncratic and completely impossible to understand. The bullying actually got so bad that the girls had to be sent home early from school each day just so they could avoid the other children on campus who'd be waiting to torment them. Because the twins wouldn't speak to anyone besides each other, they earned the nickname, the Silent Twins. Their parents sent them to speech therapists and regular therapists to try to understand why the girls just wouldn't talk. But the girls refused to talk to anyone, and they wouldn't even talk to each other when the therapists were in the room. The only breakthrough a therapist has with them is when she's able to get the girls to read on tape for her, but only after she's left the room. Okay. I was shy, but I wasn't that shy. These girls are starting to worry me a bit. So a speech therapist finally figured out the strange language that the girls spoke to each other was a combination of Barbados slang with broken English spoken really, really fast so that no one could understand what they were saying. And on top of that, the girls had West Indian accents and pronounced their S's as SHs because of their speech impediment, which is why it was literally impossible to understand what they were saying. Their language truly had a little bit of everything, and they were the only native speakers of it in existence. Apparently, the Gibbons gabbling is an example of cryptophagia, a real phenomenon when twins invent their own language, which I literally didn't even know there was a word for that. The more you know. Experts also said that cryptophagia was present because the twins mirrored their movement exactly. The Gibbons therapist said she could tell that June really wanted to speak to her, but it was like Jennifer wouldn't let her. Ooh, this is gonna be good. She detected the subtlest eye movements from Jennifer every time June looked like she was about to say something. June called this eye language. You've heard of body language? Get ready for body language's terrifying cousin, eye language. <sighs> shivers. The therapist said it was as if June was possessed by her twin. The Gibbons family would try to get the girls to engage with them in dinner conversation or with their three other siblings. But besides their younger sister, Rosie, June and Jennifer refused to speak to anyone else besides each other, and their parents were at a loss. No kidding. On the recommendation of multiple therapists, the girls were sent to different boarding schools in the hopes that they would branch out and learn to be independent. But when the parents tell the girls they were gonna be separated, 
the girls lost their fucking minds. They started screaming and crying and even began hitting each other and digging their nails into each other's skin. And June ends up pulling a huge chunk out of Jennifer's hair and they sprint out of the therapist's office. And the therapist is like, I think that went well. When the girls got to their respective boarding schools, they both completely isolated themselves to the point where they would just lay in their beds like they were in a coma. They wouldn't talk or eat or even move. And when people tried to move them, they would go completely limp and make it more difficult to help them. When their parents and therapists realized that things were not going to plan, they pulled the girls out of school and took them back home. When the girls were back home, things got better for the twins. Well, not necessarily better, but just back to the normal not talking to anyone but each other's shtick. But hey, at least they weren't catatonic anymore. So baby steps, right? When the girls were reunited after boarding school, they spent the first two years together completely isolated in their bedroom with their door shut. And the shit that happens in that room is so beyond bizarre. So the girls would make these big elaborate plays for their dolls that were always in this like weird soap opera style. And the only way we know this is because they would sometimes record themselves doing it on tape and give it to their sister Rosie as a gift. One of their favorite things to do was be each other. So Jennifer would say, I'm June now, so you're Jennifer. And they would play out scenes and scenarios as each other. And when one of them wanted to stop, they would say, okay, I want myself back now. I'll give you yourself back. And by no means am I a child psychologist, but I've got to imagine that that stuff really messes with your head. The girls' identities were already so tangled up in each other that I'm really scared as to how this sort of charade fueled their fires. I mentioned that the girls like to play pretend with their dolls, which isn't unusual for young girls. But what was unusual was the type of backstories they'd give the dolls. The girls would write down their doll characters' information in their notebooks, and when they did, they would make sure to include when and how each doll passed away, and they would create these like family origins for these dolls. Which like, can you imagine the parents walking past their children's bedroom door and hearing, what about this girl? I think she was found at the bottom of a pool. What do you think? At this point, the girls wouldn't even eat their meals at the table with their family. All their food would be sent up to their room and left on these trays outside their door. Like, the parents had completely given up at this point. As long as the girls were willing to eat, they were willing to do whatever it took. I honestly feel so bad for these parents, and it seems like the girls had almost learned how to be master manipulators. Their mom bought them personal journals for Christmas, and she was hoping this would kind of help them find themselves, or at least let mom know what the hell was going on inside their heads since they wouldn't talk to her. Each twin just wrote about the other twin most of the time, so her plan didn't exactly work, but at least she now knew what they were thinking. But the stuff that they wrote in their journals is super interesting. Jennifer wrote in her journal that the two of them had become fatal enemies, and that they each had deadly rays coming out of them that stung each other's skin. Jennifer also wonders if it's possible to get rid of her own shadow, and if she would live or not if she ever did. And I don't think she's talking about her shadow in the Peter Pan sense. June wrote about Jennifer saying that no one suffers the way she does, calling her a dark shadow that robs her of sunlight. Jesus. She says she is afraid of her sister and that her sister might do something to her one day. And then she says, and I quote, she is not normal. Someone is driving her insane and that someone is me. So you're telling me that the girls actually hated each other? But then how, why would they? Yeah, I'm just gonna accept that there's gonna be a lot of things about this case that I will never understand. So clearly there was a turning point in this relationship as the sisters really started to piss each other off. And at one point, Jennifer even tried to off June by submerging her in water. June and Jennifer started getting into these heated arguments that would often result in them strangling, hitting, and attempting to drown each other. But the girls would always make up in the end and be friends again. Up until it was time for the next big spat. Jeez, 
Talk about a toxic relationship. When the girls were teenagers, they started experimenting with drinking and the devil's lettuce. And then they started getting into petty crimes. It seemed like they were addicted to taking risks now. And when they saw that a former classmate's house had been left unlocked, they decided YOLO and went inside. The twins snooped around without any sort of motive besides just getting back at a classmate who used to torment them. They rifled through clothes, touched valuable items, and even broke a door. But when the parents came home unexpectedly, the pair was caught red-handed. The owners of the home had known of the girls and felt bad for them, so they just ended up letting them go home. They tried to ask the girls why they were there and what they were doing, but the silent twins were unsurprisingly silent. I know, big shock there, right? After the break-in at their classmates' home, the Gibbons girls were suddenly obsessed with their classmates' brothers, and they started hanging out with them and partaking in even more risky youth activities. The girls would put on a full beat of makeup to hang out with these guys. They'd bring a bottle of whatever and would walk to some place to go hang out with them. As their rebellion phase continued, June and Jennifer would graffiti walls, play Ding Dong Ditch, and then when that wasn't enough, they decided to dip their toes into the world of arson. Yes, really. So they burned down a tractor store together, and then they set fire to Pembroke Technical College, which is how they're eventually caught. And I thought my rebellion phase of bottom eyeliner and listening to Paramore was hardcore. At age 19, the girls were arrested and a judge ordered them to a high security psychiatric hospital in England. June and Jennifer lived in this institution for 11 long, terrible years. Within days of arriving there, June attempted to take her own life and Jennifer attacked a nurse. So it's not exactly going great. The girls were studied by experts the entire time they're there, and the experts have never seen anything like them before. So they were absolutely fascinated. When they tried to separate the girls, the girls once again went bananas and started screaming, yanking their hair out, and clinging to the walls but the doctors insist it's for their own good. The twins were catatonic for most of the time, staring fixed at the walls or lying silently on their beds. But then the nurses and orderlies started to notice something happening that they just couldn't explain. Time to sprinkle in the spook, y'all. They have stories where they said they would walk into one twin cell and she'd be standing there frozen in this really specific awkward position and would just hold it there for hours. And when they would go down the hall to the other twin cell, the other twin would be standing there, frozen like a statue, holding the exact same pose as her sister. If you saw that in a horror movie, you'd be like, Psh, that can't be real. But it actually happened. They also noticed that the twins developed specific eating habits, where one would eat a ton of food at one time, and the other would barely eat. And a week later, it would be vice versa. I don't think these girls were born psychopaths, but I can't completely rule out that they probably struggled with some form of mental illness. But the powerful twin connection that the girls were about to display when they get out is something that I don't think I'll ever be able to comprehend. At some point during their hospitalization, the twins agreed that one of the twins would need to kick the bucket in order for the other to have any chance at living a free life. Wait. What? After 11 years in the maximum security hospital, when the girls were almost 30, they were set to be released to a more minimum security institution back home in Wales. On the morning of March 9th, 1993, the girls were taken by bus to the facility. On the bus, Jennifer laid down on June's lap and she said, at long last, we're out. And then she slept with her eyes open. Upon arriving at the facility, Jennifer wouldn't wake up. No freaking way. She was taken to the hospital, and despite the doctor's efforts, Jennifer passed away of what they could only guess was some sort of inflammation in her heart. Doctors found no traces of meds or poison in her system, and no previous heart conditions. She had just suddenly passed away. 
June said that she felt free at last, and that Jennifer gave up her life so that she could be liberated. June believed for the rest of her life that Jennifer willed her heart to stop. June went through her grieving period like any twin would, but after that, she lived a semi-normal life and tried to live it to the fullest for the both of them. She was still shy and reserved, but she'd talk to people and would just kind of go about her business. June said that after discussing it, they both had agreed that Jennifer had to be the one to sacrifice her life that day, and so she did. Can you believe? The silent twins lived very troubled lives, and it's so hard to understand what they meant by feeling trapped by their own shadow. Was this just an exaggeration from a dramatic preteen who was fighting with her sister? Or was there a deeper psychological factor at play, which caused the girls to go so far as to making a suicide pact? This is easily the strangest pair of twins I've ever heard of. Speaking of pairs, time to dig into this pear crisp. 